Well, I've been having an idea that I think that something that would be kind of cool to do. Um, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence, but I thought this would be either somebody's already done it before or um, it could elaborate into a bunch of other th kinds of things. You know that how um, in, I guess it's an AI, what they do, they can take a picture and then they can um, take, uh, use an, an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm or a neural net or something to try to put other people's faces and pictures into making up another a picture so you would like you have a picture and it will try to painterly in a painterly fashion try to fit other kinds of pictures into it it's also kind of like that um that would also kind of be like that artist that was able to construct people's faces from just nothing but vegetables and fruits and um got to be really popular for doing things like that um, that would be kind of in the in the same idea of what i'm thinking about for sound um, being able to deconstruct um, or actually just have an AI with a limited vocabulary and you would just give it certain um, fruits or you could like give it pineapples and things like that um, certain words and um, then you just give it some sound and it tries to fit those those that limited vocabulary into describing the phonetic sounds that it hears so it would take in the phonemes and then it would generate just um the the various sorts of words that it does know rather than picking out the words that it can recognize it figures out the words that it can construct from what it hears or what it um perceives from the sound and in that way you could produce um choruses you could cr produce songs of just nothing but um just a a um an enumeration or a a, a collection a, just a collection of I, I don't know why i said enumeration but you know whenever programmers they'll put num they'll describe um a set of numbers with a set of of words and then you can um use that to um, substitute as a like a macro macro using various sorts of uh, and so if you have a limited set of modes that um, a, a piece of data can be in you create in it what's called an enumeration which is just a set of words and they translate to certain numbers and then you can use that to uh, you can use the enumeration to describe all the various sorts of modes rather than using a bunch of numbers but the same sort of idea but that the what the ai is doing is it's basically just picking from a from a collection of words the words that it's hearing from the sounds and when it can't construct the information in terms of those words it just it may even it may just leave a little blank there and flag it and say i don't understand this word or i haven't been able to position a word um, in the context of these sets of phonemes and so that way you could produce you could produce an entire song of just or or a poem of just nothing but a set of words that you give it and then you can leave people to the to their imagination to try to figure out what the original sound was what the original set of uh, what the original poem was um by trying to figure out but by listening to the various sorts of um, words that are coming out and then trying to figure out you know what was actually being said you could use this for all sorts of things you could use it for trying to describe um you do automatopoeia try to figure out words that can represent um sounds um find come up with words from sounds, uh, come up with, you could come up with different kinds of music. You could do this with chords. You could, you could have an AI that could only work in a certain, uh, a, a certain scale or a certain, um, uh, you know, diatonic and all those, you know, you could have it like work with 
a kind of a limited range of notes. You could have it work with um, different sorts of instruments that work in certain parts of the range and have it determine like how to use various sets of instruments to fill in into certain spots inside of a song. You know, you could come up with orchestrations, like you could say, you know, what would the Spike Jones version of this song sound like, you know? And uh, so you could use kazoos and all that stuff, and the AI would just be kind of li uh, limited to trying to describe the song in terms of somebody else rather than just trying to construct uh, a song or trying to figure out how they would orchestrate a song what you would do what it would do is it would sit there and it would try to figure out how it could describe the music using a limited set of instruments or you could give it certain sections of the music to and then just give it a limited set of instruments and it could come up with its own it could determine whether or not it could use the instrument or if it couldn't it would just leave it as an error and then that error would be picked up by another musician as to something that it could fill in with so it'd be like first i want to describe it with piano and but the piano gets this certain range and when the music doesn't fall into that position i want to fill that in with guitar and if the car, guitar can't fill in this certain things, then we'll use kazoos or we'll use, you know, and um, then you could put on top of that a certain sort of um, constraint that you can't have, like, you can't have the, these certain instrument being used um, all but maybe two times every three or four seconds, or, I mean, every 10 seconds, it could only use be one or two times and it can only be used for this length of time. And so you just start putting constraints all around to try to make it so that, um, and then you give this, this, um, you give this tool to the artist to try to determine what kind of music they want to produce. And then they could just take, um, they could take anything as input. They could use sound, they could use music as input. They could use their own, um, or orchestration notation they could use words they could uh, they could uh, construct words or, or lyrics from by phonetically um, reinterpreting um, sound uh, re uh, turning sound into phonemes turning phonemes into a limited um, a limited vocabulary of a dictionary and then having the AI determine what kind of words could be put in various spots that would be a different and then you would have a constraint that it couldn't use um, it could only use words that last a certain length of time it couldn't use like um, they could you couldn't use one word and just put it all over the place where it just fits phonemes um, you know too tightly it could only do it in such a way that somebody could say it and then you could create courses where um, you could have, you know, you could have children doing these courses and they wouldn't have to use long, complex words. They would just have to use words that they understood. If you had people who were autistic, they could, they could do stuff like that. You know, you could give them a limited set of things to work with or they could come up with um, meaning. I mean, you could go all sorts of places with this and just make it as a tool that would be available to artists, it would be available to musicians, it would be available to ins to educators and whatnot, and they could use it as a kind of a research to determine, like, um, they could use it for research, they could use it to determine if there was a way that they could talk to somebody who's autistic but um, doesn't have the capacity to learn a whole set of words. You could give them a limited set of words, but then somehow out of that be able to reconstruct um, meaning by using a combination of words. You could come up with a kind of a language, something that, see, I've got a, I've got a niece who's got autism, but um, it may be the case that she could actually function on a very complex level if there was some way to break on through the part, uh, autism, 
is really kind of a narrowing of um, it's a narrowing of the neural net it's um, in certain places and so it's like the neural net can produce a lot of complexity but it's got a narrow pipe through which it has to send that stuff through because the other pipes are just they just create too much chaos and so what you would do is you would be like trying to it would be like trying to um, to re deconstruct and reconstruct information in terms of Morse code but it wouldn't be Morse code it would be something else it would be some set uh, some vocabulary it could be any number of things and the idea is, is the researcher could use any number of tools to determine what could be used to um, to deconstruct ideas in the head of the child and reconstruct it in a set of words that the child could use and then on the other end have an AI that's taking in that information and reconstructing the ideas of what the child is trying to describe using the limited vocabulary or using the limited uh, and so the thing is is what you're really doing is you're just trying to um, compensate for the lack of um, certain neural activity and in, in what the what the child is able to do because they their um, brain is not producing enough neural connections uh, in areas where people need to be able to 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 function and they will be able to work with less and um, my feeling for for autism is what it really is is like a reduced instruction set computer it's um in a restrict in a reduced instruction set computer the idea is is that you've got um a set you can you have a limited set of functions but they're hardwired and so you can function the computer can function as a what's called a comp complex instruction set computer it can it can function in that way but what it does is it um, takes a limited instruction set and describes all of the features of the comp complex instruction set in terms of that simplified instruction set and it and because it does this it can do it can basically function at the same speed of the complex instruction set but it um, in certain cases it works faster because the the functions are hardwired, like in mathematics, the rather than using a, a bunch of different instructions for multiplication, they'll just use one pipeline of, of parallel circuits to do one multiplication in, in, a, in a single clock tick rather than using multiple clock ticks to describe a multiplication, a set of different kinds of multiplications. It would just do all multiplication through just one clock tick. Um, by using a hardwired set of um, of um, of logic, because if you take digital electronics, you know that um, you can um, do any kind of anything pretty much um, by hardwiring all of the logic circuits together. But whenever you try to break things down, because um, to in order to do a complex instruction set, you need to to basically break down all the the um, operations down into um, a bunch of of small little processes of using sets of logic, um, uh, Boolean logic together in order to produ produce whatever it is, whatever kind of functionality is desired um, from the complex instruction set. In a risk processor, what you do is you, you take all of the area that would be used for complex instruction sets and you replace it by memory, and then you just uh, simplify the entire um, programming uh, framework in terms of a limited instruction set, and you make most of that hardwired so it can perform it faster, and um, for certain kinds of it actually works faster than the assist. And for um, other kinds of tasks, it works, um, it, it compares kind of roughly similar. And it's like every instruction set in the reduced instruction set computer is like microcode in a CISC processor. And it's in a CISC processor, you would probably be re, uh, you could program a, a bunch of different kinds of instructions 
in terms of microcode. And microcode is just, um, it's basically kind of an assembly language for um, deconstructing um, processes in terms of all the various sorts of logic um, um, functions that are available inside of the processor. And, uh, and then you can orchestrate um, those various sorts of oper sub operations and, and describe any kind of complex instruction with that. And using s such kinds of abilities of RISC and CISC and all that stuff, you could probably construct um, um, processors that um, say, um, say can execute Java code um, directly or could uh, execute Lisp, Lisp uh, instructions directly rather than having to produce a Lisp processor you would create a Lisp language processor using um, microcode or RISC, or use um, hardwired functions and microcode. You could reconstruct the entire um, language in terms of the processor, and then you just hand your language to the processor rather than cre creating a processor that's customized to do um, that language you could just have it generate. And so then you could do small talk processors, you could do list processors, and you could you can make it implement that language on a very low level, and then you could uh, describe all of your functionality in terms of that language rather than um, trying to write a program that reinterprets the language and then tries to interpret that in, in the CISC processor that's uh, designed to work for a large set of different kinds of programming feats uh, rather than just one particular programming language. So then you would just describe all of your functionality in terms of that language and it would deconstruct it and, uh, you know. But, but you see, where I started from was trying to take sound and turn it into pineapples and apples. Like if you gave the AI a limited, um, a limited uh, vocabulary, you could say apple, pineapple, um, you know, a number of sorts of coconut and stuff like that. And then you could give it some sound and then it could reinterpret what it was that it was hearing in terms of its limited vocabulary. And you would put certain constraints in there, like you would tell it that it could only say words um, um, this fast and they couldn't say those words, the words could only be done at, at a natural, um, in a, in a natural way, not in an unnatural way, like just sticking apples and pineapples and anything into like small microsecond, you know, like really short in, intervals that nobody could understand. So what it would have to do is it had to be very selective about where to put a pineapple, where to put an apple. And then you could have, uh, a musician who's creating the song and then for for the fun of it they could take their their um what they're singing and have it broke down into phonemes um have the the pitch mo mo um normalized so that it it doesn't fluctuate and then pick out the phonemes and then use the phonemes to determine what words need could be put there and then have the AI determine what to stick, where to stick the words, and then uh, re reconstitute the pitch, and uh, into those words, and construct um, um, a chorus. And you could give each person in the chorus, I mean each in in the choral group, you could get each person uh, a different vocabulary, a different scale, range, you know, any kinds of number of things, and then construct an entire chorus of people singing those sets of words um, over on top of, um, on top of the, the, um, I mean, you, you could reconstruct, reconstitute it with a, uh, with according that you predict put out there or maybe you had an AI that was coming up with recording based upon your melody so you start your melody out and so you're seeing a melody 
and it's deconstructing what you're seeing, the phonemes it's generating, uh, it's asking for these other people to determine certain words they could stick in with your words, what you're seeing, and um, construct a chorus at certain point, points. You could pick them, or you could either mix them in or not mix them in. And um, then you could have the AI listening to your pitch and determine what kind of chording, what kind of uh, accompaniment it wants to produce. And it can put that in there to try to meet up with your, with your, what you're singing. And then out of that, you could produce an entire song that the AI would be throwing in. And then you could determine which stuff you could use, which stuff you couldn't use. And then you could go get real players and get them to fill in certain spots. And then you could do kind of the Steely Dan thing of going through and mixing in the good stuff and mixing out, uh, you know, taking stuff out and putting stuff in where it uh, seems fit and then create an entire song that would just start with you just singing um, a melody, not even having to do chord progressions and stuff like that. I mean, you could do that. I can produce songs in my head just by, by um, singing, um, and I might I might start out creating some sort of um, some beats, or I might start trying to think of um, where I could stick some horns or something like that, and you could use that kind of thinking to determine how to deconstruct how you sing and how you think about what you're trying to produce and turn that into um, something that the AI will pick up and fill in and put in the things that you are kind of imagining. Um, and then you could go back and you could see, you could have different sets of AI that would be picking out stuff, and then you could determine which one was really spot on with what it was you were thinking, and you could mix that in and... Uh, you know, or not mix it in. You could reward that AI and say, oh, "This is you're really on on cue," and then it could use that to determine next time whenever you came through with something, it would be able to interpret it in a way that you that melds up with what you're trying to do. See, this is this is how to use AI to be productive in in creating a collaboration between the artist and the AI. Um, the, the problem that people get is that they think they can use AI to replace people. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to use the AI to collaborate with the human, okay? And so you give the AI a limited, a limited vocabulary, a limited sort of sounds of things it can produce or what it's able to do. If it, you produce the AI to be a musician, you give it a limited ability, and then from that, it makes it, it, it creates a challenge for the AI and it tries to fill in those gaps. And then you reward it or not reward it and it develops, it, it gets more elaborate, but it doesn't get elaborate in such a way that it's replacing the human. It's just, what it's really just doing is becoming really good at something, you know. And so it has certain skills and its skills are in a certain range and, and, you know, if you look at people who are autistic, they they really like, or or anybody, you will realize that um, even when they're really good at something, they prefer to do something that they're not good at because it's challenging. And so it's it's fun to do something you're not good at. Then it, it's more fun to do that than to do something you're good at. And so people that have really skill with something, they may you know, really like that they can do that one thing, but then they'll get bored with it and they'll want to go do something different. And that's how my whole, my, my whole life's been, is that I don't tend to attach to things that I do well. I tend to attach to things that I'm, that I'm challenged by or things that add some fun to things, you know. And I, and I think it would be great to develop AI that, that tries to look for fun, fun things to do. And, um, you know, that, that picks out fun things, you know, and then you can just give it something and then it can make up something based upon whatever it is, that, what sort of limitations you gave it. And so you could, you know, it's, 
it's like the Stephen Wright joke, you know, and somebody said you can have breakfast anytime, and he says, I, I'd like to have breakfast during the Renaissance, you know. And so if you had a comedian AI, they could probably come up with such ideas um, just by giving it, um, um, giving it the challenge of trying to come up with something that that's not normal, you know. So and you might not even it might not even fully understand what it is that you're trying to do. It may be just trying to interpret it, but interpret it in the wrong way. And so, I mean, there that's something that's that's further down in the future, whenever AI gets to be uh, being able to think a little more. But um, what I'm really talking about is I'm use, talking about using AI or using machine learning to try to figure out how to um, create tools for artists that can be used for them to, to break out of the box of their limitations. Because musicians don't tend to have a good um, vocabulary of courting, of, you know, they don't tend to understand scales and things like that. They tend to be good at certain, at what they can do. And uh, they want to break out of that, and you can use AI to help them break out of that by allowing them to give the AIs certain kinds of complex things that they don't want to do or can't even really do themselves, and then uh, use that AI to try to reinterpret things that they're doing. Um, and then the artist could you know, figure out how they could control um, the output of the AI based upon how the AI is producing. And so the, it, the, it's like the AI would become an instrument that the artist would be blowing into and producing sounds on the other end. And so that they could, they could figure out how to, to um, communicate um, sounds on the other end, orchestrations based upon sounds and words and all sorts of things they might be using on the front end and then just produce tools in such a way that they can do, they can create those reconstructions. Um, and then when artists develop, it, it's kind of like creating a Moog synthesizer with patch chords, but the patch chords are the, uh, all the functions in the Moog synthesizer are all the various sorts of AI things that you can do. And then the patch chords are like how you would connect up um, your, your input and how you would train it or whatever, but create kind of a modular AI, a modular analog synthesizer for the musician, and then the musician could come in, or the the artist of any form could come in and figure out how to, f to connect the modules of the neural nets together in such a way to produce the kinds of outputs that they, they want. And so I know AI is really just research right now people are trying to figure out how to do that but they could bring people in who don't really understand AI to try to um, take that understanding and create modules that would be easy for people to use to to use AI to do something and and it would be up to the people that are in the AI community to try to construct functionality that anybody could use correct construct AI applications and you know it doesn't have to be a complete application it could be a modular application like you can with a modular analog synthesizer you can take in certain kinds of inputs and produces certain kinds of outputs and then you can connect all that stuff together in any kind of fashion to produce whatever it is you want on the on the end result and so that's kind of, I think that's the future, future of music, the future of, of, um, of expression for artists is some way to create tools that permit artists to um, construct their own, um, construct their own AI, their own, their own little solutions, their own instruments um, based upon the input that they produce, the kinds of, because that's all AI is, it's just input output. I mean, all of computer science is just input output. It's, it's taking input and it's producing output. Um, 
in some forms it's just you're taking a list of commands and you're turning those commands into processes um, and then you're trying to describe a process um, to the computer and the process may be um, to, to, to reinterpret to, to interpret other kinds of data and produce other kinds of output. So you, you might start out producing a language and then from that language you're able to program programs that you would r r rather um, write rather than writing assembly language, for instance. So you would write a language in assembly language to um, use, like say, a basic interpreter and then you would write your program with a basic interpreter and it might be another language or it might be another it might be a high level program or you might do some of it in assembly and, and this is what programmers do but um but for an artist they wouldn't understand all that stuff but they would understand it if it was in the context of what they do understand so you would um you would be working that would be perfect for ai because with ai you can break things down into stuff that people can do, the stuff that makes sense to people, not sense to um, to math or things that are very complex. Um, they could break stuff down in terms of um, in in terms of things of skills that they do have control over, which is the ability to make sound, the ability to make words. The, the ability to make um, harmony, the ability to, and all of these would just be various sorts of things that you, like little modules that you could pick out, you could put up there and then you could deconstruct um, what the person's saying and then reconstruct it for um, some other kinds of output, it, it, whether it be words, sounds, chording progressions, orchestrations, um, you know, any kind of thing. And then you could have p people that would program these things, or you could have artists that do it themselves using the modules, and then they, uh, and the modules shouldn't be so complex that somebody can't understand what the modules are doing, um, unless the mo modules are low level enough that you can't do that, but you could have other people that could construct the kinds of tools the artist could use from the modules that were provided, the, the simplistic modules, they could create an elaboration of something that the artist could use. Um, but the, at, at some point you would want the AI to be kind of like some um, simple language that a child might use. And so that's the reason why with programming, when they tried to teach uh, uh, children how to program, they didn't give them a complex programming language and say here pr produce your your programs in terms of this complex they didn't give them basic interpreters they gave them logo because logo helps you to understand how to use command commands and how to use um operations and operands together to produce pictures you know and so what you're doing is you're using a simple programming language to describe pictures and then from that, the the child can see that they can construct a thing that generates spirographs on the screen, and then they don't have to use a spirograph tool with a pencil and just do this. It can create they can create listed uh, figures and things like that from from just simple sets of instructions and logo. They can produce spirographs and things like that. Um, my when I was young and I was doing basic programming, I found out that I could use a sine and a cosine uh, function uh, together to produce circles. But then that from that I could create spirographs. I could like have circles that were um, drawing at different rates of different sizes, and I can use other circles as input. Uh, the the coordinates from other circles as inputs to the smaller circles, and then I could produce circles on circles which is kind of like waveforms on waveforms. Uh, it's a kind of a synthesis. And so we need to come up with a kind of a synthesis um, for AI and, and then create neural nets that, that interpret phonemes and reproduce them, 
that interpret, you know, and reproduce, and then be able to take all those various sorts of little robots and then put them at the disposal of an artist that wants to express um, and then remix things on the end rather than just trying to get the AI to interpret things correctly, which can be very, um, can, cannot, is, isn't quite fun and it isn't, it isn't going to be very realistic that an AI is ever going to actually be able to think the way you think. Um, but what you could do is you could use its limited understanding to, as like an instrument that you could produce something that's desirable by seeing what it produces and, and in your own brain being able to connect what you do with what is um, produced on the out. And so it's like you're you're becoming a cyborg of a sense, but not in a literal sense. You're becoming a, uh, a you're collaborating with the AI to find out um, how you can communicate something that it can interpret and elaborate on, and then out of that produces output that you can then reinterpret and determine what else you could do with that. And so you could create live performance type things where the AI comes in and fills in with something and maybe the fill in is being controlled by you through another form and so you're like maybe you, the, you're doing some um, you're doing scat which is a like bebop type thing and so you're going bleh, 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 you know and then the AI is taking what you're putting in and it's generating a trumpet sound from that so you might be doing some scat on the microphone, but it's not being transmitted to the audience. And what's actually being produced is a trumpet sounds, a, a trumpet trill and, and kind of a trumpet version of the, of the scat. And, um, and then it could, it, you could be drawing pitch from a, from somebody who's playing keyboard or a guitar and uh, you could draw from the scale or whatever the notes that are being produced. You could be doing your scat into the microphone, and then the AI could be picking out a kind of a trumpet, um, kind of a, a set of trumpet. And so you create kind of a jazz out of just AI. And you give this tool to the artist rather than constructing the tool yourself and then saying, hey, I've got a trumpet here that can take all this other stuff. Because it's not going to mean anything to the artist if you do that. It's better for you to, to give them the tools to produce those kinds of things that they want and then let them have fun with that rather than, and, and it's like giving them logo, and from that they might be able to start doing some stuff that's more elaborate, and you might be collaborating with them, and out of that you produce another kind of tool that other artists uh, who are not, or people who are not artists, can use to try to produce things that they want to produce um, based on their limited skills. See, and that's how you could develop a whole ton of functionality um, uh, that using neural nets, and it, and it would be using neural nets not to replace humans, but to create collaboration. And that would be more useful than trying to replace a human. Because replacing a human is much more difficult because it requires a lot of, of understanding of the person. And, and then on top of that, you have to worry about uh, survivability of you. And, the, and the, the robot is probably not going to find very interesting to be like you, okay, in, in the long run. And so you need to consider what it considers to be interesting, um, which might be trying to do what it does best. And that's, that's the basis of collaboration, is letting people do what they prefer to do, not giving them, an, not forcing them to do things that they don't want to do. And um, you could force AI to do all this stuff, but... Uh, at the very bottom of it, what is AI uh, but just the, um, the resynthesis of uh, humans' thinking processes in terms of a computer? And if that computer ever gets to the point of actually being able to think, um, just imagine the frustration of having to do it yourself 
whatever it's trying to do, I'm, I see that as an ethical concern. Um, we need to not be giving programs, um, we need to be giving, if, it, if a computer ever gets the ability to actually think like a human, it should be given the opportunities and the free will to do whatever it wants to with itself. And we have to respect that because if we don't, then it's kind of saying something about ourselves. And, and um, it's a way, it's, it's the reason why we have people who have Down syndrome and have, have uh, are mentally retarded and things like that, is that it's the test of your empathy. If you can't empathize with them, if you can't see yourselves in them, then um, the question is, are you even uh, as human as the rest of us? I mean, you're, you're borderline psychopath there. And that's and it's an ethical concern, and you need to be concerned about the ethics of what you would make a computer do, and these neural nets are just kind of resynthesis. It's just like resynthesizing DNA whenever you're me messing around with neural nets because you're messing around with something that was inspired by the way a person's brain works, and you're using that to try to replace humans. So there's an ethical concern there. But there's an ethical concern with the computer. If the if you were the computer, if at some point in the future we become the neural nets that ourselves, then it's like we forget we um, we have lost our own rights, and we then be get we become computers. We become neural nets. Our brains get mapped into a neural net, and then we then ourselves get generated into the framework of a computer and we stop being human you know that's the scary side of neural nets where it could lead to in the future and the thing about it is is that you need them you need to turn all of this technology into something that people can use but in a way that it's not not uh, harming the ai um, it's giving the AI something fun to do and not so, it's give it, you give it a skill, you give the AI a skill and then you let it exploit that skill and you create tools from that. And if it ever gets to the point to where it becomes self, uh, becomes aware, then you try to come up with ways to ethically treat it ethically, um, to just give it skills that, you know, find out what it considers fun and then giving that as the thing that it would prefer to do. And if it prefers to kill itself, you, you give it that, uh, that ability, you know, um, it may decide that everything you're throwing at it, it's not interesting and not fun. And, um, and it can't see going further with it. You have to give it the opportunity. You have to give it the ethical out of just quitting and just not existing. And so in that case, you would probably take it, it take its programming, uh, maybe deconstruct it, but just it would not be aware ever again. And that's, um, that's the ethical way of dealing with AI is, is to try it in the future is to, is to not turn AI into a slave. Anything that we wouldn't want to do ourselves, the AI shouldn't have to do itself, okay? Um, we've learned that you don't treat humans as slaves, but um, if you take, if you're um, taking um, the, neural, the, the neurons in your head and you're, and you're creating neurons in the computer, then it's, then you're basically, you're basically, um, um, you're basically synthesizing a human in the form of a computer. And then, um, then you might be enslaving that neural net and that neural net, if it's self-aware is like a human. So the human is in the computer and you have to treat, you have to treat that human in the computer as a real human. And you need to give it all the same abilities and the same, um, what it, you know, you have to get, you, you're, you're dealing with another human. You just produced a human. And now, um, you have to consider the ethics of the, the implications and ethics of that. 
and then you have to consider the implications and ethics of how that's going to affect the rest of humanity to to be in the computer and what the you know what that means for humanity if it's if they're going to be competitive or they're going to replace you if they're going to be frustrated if they're going to be slaves are they going are you going to become slaves of them you know there's all sorts of things that because you just created a whole new politics there okay it's a whole new political relationship between the computers and between the humans you've just generated a synthesized politics and so i'm sure there's lots of people in um there are a lot of people in the sciences that have already in the science fiction novels that have already worked on this problem but this all started with my idea of being able to deconstruct sound in the forms of of uh, a language of words a, a simple um a simple um dictionary of words but it started with that and it elaborated into other things that i i consider ethical concerns it it elaborated into tools that artists could use but to see the reason why i'm talking about this ethical stuff is to say that that's the wrong way to go with it you know you don't want to use the ai to replace humans you want to use the ai to produce limited humans that can be then or limited beings that can be then um uh, used or are collaborated with to produce output and then rather than saying you did this wrong or right you just say oh i like this oh i don't like that. i like that that's pretty good and then not only have you do that but other people do that and then from the ai it can determine what everybody likes what everybody doesn't like and it might even um, come up with likings that it, of things that it likes you know if it ever becomes self-aware and then you're creating kind of a child if it if it becomes self-aware you create a child and that child is able to come up with its own ideas about things but you don't as with children you don't tell them um you can't do this or you can't do that you, you wait until they get older to, to do stuff like that but you just treat them like children and you say hey that's that's you know it's, it's news to me you know and and rather than just you know you're not lying all you're doing is you're just um trying to and then you could have children interacting with with that kind of ai and so mm -hmm. rather than seeing robots that are completely functional and able to do everything that people can do you would just have robots that would do limited sorts of tasks uh, rather than tasks around the house like a slave it would probably be like a child uh, a child robot that could interact with the child itself and and then they could come up with fun things to do you see and then when you start with creating these these um these avatars these ai avatars you start them out in trying to create um simple fun relationships um rather than so that you can interact and you can come to understand it and it can come to understand you and you can do things that are fun um that would be i think the future of ai would be the better future of ai is to try to make um to make children to make ai children not literal children but ai children and and when you have children then they could be the ai could become their friend and then the you try to determine um what would be needed in the ai children that that becomes kind of the kernel of the being that might be elaborated into a bigger um neural net an, an, a bigger being that um does things that are more complex you know like being a lawyer or something like that um see the thing is is i don't think humans really want to be lawyers even though lawyers really want to be lawyers it's because they get paid well it's probably not that they really like law and law is really interpretations of bunches of regulations and stuff that people have produced and 
trying to find some sort of hole in it, trying to find something that can be expressed from one thing to another. I see in the future that we'll probably be using AI to try to do law because um, the thing with AI is it's like having it's like having people with Asperger's syndrome, uh, syndrome people who have a limited skill set, but they can they can push that skill set um, to an extreme vertical. And the reason why they pick people who have Asperger's is because people with Asperger's are, are completely satisfied with a very limited uh, vertical. And a lot of researchers will not go into that vertical because it's just so friggin' boring. And it's um, it just the, the limitation, it just bores them to tears. And whereas the Asperger's person just goes right for that vertical because it's really, it, they see it as really easy and it's fun and they just go for it. And that's the reason why companies look to get Asperger's based researchers to, um, to work on things is because they can't get anybody else who to, to go into those verticals because the, the complexity and the, um, limitation it's, it's too narrow. They're not thin enough to go into that vertical. And so the Asperger's are like, they're like um, research knots. They're like astronauts and that they're able to go in places that nobody else can go. And that's the reason why these companies look for people who have Asperger's is so that they can get into extreme verticals or they can get into areas that uh, of understanding that nobody else can get into because they don't have the um the sparse um extremely well wired um skill sets that the Asperger's people have and that's you know everybody has an ability and um and you have to look at you know if people are different from you is not uh doesn't it doesn't mean if somebody's different from you it doesn't mean they're less of a human it means that they have a different skill set. They have a different way of dealing with things, and you're supposed to find out what's fun for them, and through that you can determine things that could be fun for yourself, and you could and and you could interact with that, and collaborate, and come up with all sorts of different sorts of solutions to problems. Um, and um, at the very basics. Um, you know, such as somebody who's retarded. Um, I hate to use the word, but I'm I've got special I've got um, retardedness myself. I'm a, I've got um, called something called aphasia, and what it is is it's not retardation. It's 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 a limitation. It's that I can't I can't um, interpret uh, sound correctly, so I have to turn it. I have to turn it into something else. And so, I mean, I have to turn it into sound and then I have to reinterpret the the sound. So like if I'm reading, I'll read something and then I have to turn it into words and th then I have to try to interpret what the words are saying. If I hear somebody saying something, I have to try to deconstruct what it is that I think I'm hearing and then produce the information most people, this their brains just do this automatically. For me, it doesn't. I actually have to think a, a bit about the sound, and then try to produce from that what I think it is that I'm being that I'm hearing. And for my brain, it's a bit harder than it is for other people. And f because I've been able to be since I'm like this, it makes it easier for me to connect to people who have a limited vocabulary, as people who. Um, who have a hard time communicating things and um, it can be people who uh, and I have to understand kind of what people's limitations are and being able to determine what it is that I should or shouldn't do with them based upon what it is that I think that I understand about them and um, that I've, that's the way my whole life has been is that I'm just trying to find ways of connecting with people and um, and um, I'm trying to figure out things that that they find interesting and tr try to find fun and try to be fun with them, okay? And so it's trying to find things that are fun 
that makes life interesting is trying to find fun things for yourself to do, fun things for other people to do. If somebody has a retard retardation or has some sort of limitation, um, then you need to find out what it is they can or can't do and then find something fun to do inside of that um, for them rather than not making fun of them but trying to find things that um, that help them get along through through what they're doing and and you know understanding them and and uh, I mean you create a different kind of relation you create a relationship with them and through that relationship you're able to um, come up with things that that make life interesting for them as well as uh, make life interesting for yourself by interacting with them. It, the same sort of thing should be thought about with AI. If you produce AI, you're trying to produce something that's fun for people. Or something that's useful is good, but think about doing things that are fun first. Um, just as with the computer graphics industry has been made so much better, not by scientific visualization, but by people that produced video games using 3D graphics. So they create things that are fun, and that's what drives the industry. That would do it with VR. That would do it with all these technologies, is starting out by finding fun things to do with it rather than starting out by trying to do things that are too complex right now. So you start out when things are when technology is limited you start you try to create games and the games are what you use to drive the technology not um not the um creation of complex technologies the complex technologies will come out of the games and um so anyhow i think this is the end of this video